Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Servos Medical Masterclass. My name is Dave Briggs, and I'll be your commentator. We have a truly exceptional faculty to present the clinical research behind a promising alternative to traditional arthroplasty. But before we begin, one reminder, be sure to make frequent use of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for joining us today. And it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Robin Young, publisher and editor of Orthopedics This Week. Robin, the program is yours. Thank you, David, and thank you to all of our attendees today. Uh, we do have an outstanding faculty, uh, and I wanna begin this class with a simple observation. Not every patient with severe osteoarthritis of the knee is an ideal candidate for total knee arthroplasty. But for those patients, what are the alternatives? Today, we're gonna to examine one well-studied, minimally invasive biologic alternative, which focuses on subchondral delivery of, a, of bone marrow and autogenous bone. Today's faculty will discuss clinical studies, including one with 15-year follow-up, optimal patient profiles for the approach, and other practical considerations. Our first uh, speaker today is Harlan Adler, the co-founder of Servos, who will briefly cover the details of this technology. Harlan. Thank you, Robin. So who is Servos? Servos is a newly launched medical device company that is a joint venture between Ramfac Corp an established medical device manufacturing company, and Endo Solutions, a company at the cutting edge of orthobiologic research and development. Operating out of a 40,000 square foot facility in the greater Boston area, Ranfac is a trusted supplier to the medical device industry, with capabilities in each stage of product development, and an expertise in full source manufacturing, class one and two medical devices. The Ranfac's capabilities and Endo Solutions family of intellectual property and expertise in the science of bone marrow drive stem cells and vasculogenesis, we have developed a line of proprietary tools to enable novel approaches to a variety of procedures, one of which we will learn about today. Our goals, to improve patient outcomes safely, economically, and of course, minimally invasively. Looking forward, our combined capabilities will allow us to accelerate the pace of innovation to expand our line in accordance to emerging cl clinical needs. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Jeff Chabot, who will briefly give a more detailed introduction to the line and expand on the underlying science that ties the portfolio together. I'll be here for the Q&A portion for any questions regarding our organization, as well as to discuss exclusive distribution opportunities for Servos products. Thank you, Harlan. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm excited to tell you all about the suite of clinical tools that we've developed at Servos, uh, starting with our underlying principles all the way through to the tools that you can hold in your hands to improve patients' lives. Because at its heart, that's why we're all here today. You know, at Servos, I like to think that our unwritten motto is, it's a long way to simple, but it's worth the trip. So we really start by thinking about how the body is able to, you know, have this amazing capacity to heal itself under most circumstances. We know that, however, sometimes the natural ability of the body to repair itself doesn't quite get the job done, sometimes because of increasing age or because the trauma is just too extensive in order to be, to be repaired uh, naturally, or sometimes because of an injury to poorly vascularized tissue, which is gonna prevent the, the cells and, and nutrients and growth factors from being able to get to the site of action in order to affect the repair. So at Servos, we develop tools that try to leverage the exact same principles that the body uses to heal itself with the goal of being able to enable and enhance uh, clinicians uh, to work with their patients to deliver consistently high quality results and to improve the ultimate outcomes. We say it all starts with the body. Uh, we think about a particular surgical procedure and say, what is going on in this procedure that enables uh, healing to take place? 
So for example, in autograft, you know, how, how can you take a chunk of bone and use it to cause other bone to, to heal, say, a fracture that was unable to heal before? Uh, in, when we think about it at its heart, the harvested bone uh, collected for autograft contains cells within a matrix in which they can do their job. And when you place those cells in that matrix into position, then they can uh, affect the healing that we're, that we're trying to generate. Uh, another case is treatment with BMPs. So how do BMPs work? Well, they're very highly inflammatory proteins, but ultimately they wind up stimulating a cellular response and then the subsequent vasculogenesis and osteogenesis that, that enables uh, injuries to be healed in some cases. So we wanna take these understanding of these underlying biological procedures and use those to innovate new tools that'll mimic the underlying processes and we'll keep the good, we'll preserve, and in some cases enhance the efficacy uh, while minimizing the associated trauma or the comorbidities that can be associated with these procedures. And this really feeds into the design principles that we apply across all of the products that we generate. So as I mentioned, we start with the science of natural healing as the driving philosophy. We'd like to work in a totally percutaneous manner to avoid uh, more invasive uh, procedures that wind up carrying their own sets of trauma uh, alongside. We want devices that are simple to use but can deliver consistent results. Um, when you use our devices, we want you to know that you're going to be able to, to get the, the high quality results you're looking for. And finally, as we think about a suite of products, we want to make sure that their properties, such as how long they are, um, what gauge needles are, um, to, will allow for synergistic use. These things can be worked together to you know, access a space and deliver into that space, for example. Um, and the Servos family of products really uh, is designed to give you, the clinicians, the ability to source and deliver biologics in a minimally invasive manner to mimic and supplement the body's natural reparative mechanisms. Some of the products that uh, you'll be hearing about today are related to bone marrow aspiration, uh, to get high quality, high cellularity bone marrow um, without the need for centrifugation. Uh, bone graft extenders, uh, a, a really wonderful scaffold that we're very excited about um, that, that gives that, the, the cells that matrix that they need to be able to work in in order to do their job. Uh, tools to access the subchondral regions, uh, various parts of the body, a couple of which are shown here. And uh, the ability to harvest bone dowels, um, which can be used uh, either for, for biopsy purposes or actually in procedures, uh, such as you'll hear about uh, later. We also have several non-surgical products. Uh, we have a platelet-rich plasma system uh, that was just cleared by the FDA. And uh, our uh, adipose processing kit, the Lipopro system, uh, which we're also very, uh, very happy with. Um, all of our products have been cleared by the FDA and are either available now or will be in the next couple of months. Um, and although today we'll be hearing uh, some really excellent talks on the repair of subchondral lesions, our devices are really used uh, designed to be used across a range of surgical specialties. And we're always eager to take on a new challenge uh, if, if the tools you look at aren't completely appropriate for what you want to do. Um, so please uh, reach out to us. And, and if, there's, if there's something that we can do, if it involves innovating a new product or reconfiguring an existing product, it's something we can certainly look into because we want to put the tools in your hands so that you can do what you do so well, uh, which is improve the lives of patients. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. And uh, it'll be my pleasure to introduce our next speaker who will be Dr. Anil Ranawa. He's going to review the state of research, including some really exciting proof of concept work uh, to demonstrate that marrow can repair subchondral lesions, uh, leading to a possible, possible alternative to traditional arthroplasty. Thank you very much. My name is Neil Ranawat. Thank you guys for uh, joining us on this. And thank you, Jeff Chabot, for a great uh, session. Before I get to my talk, I want you guys to ask you a question. And it's really going to help uh, proceed with my talk. It's going to be like a, a feeder. So when you guys treat subchondral bone lesions, what's your best approach? 
Do you prefer core decompression only? A core decompression plus an air graph, like maybe something like TCP? A core decompression plus a bioactive graph, maybe PRP or bone marrow graft? Or a biological only, say PRP or bone marrow? Or do you not treat bone marrow lesions at all? So why don't you uh, submit your answers and then we'll talk. Okay, I think everyone's voted. So our results are in, very interesting. I'd say a third of people, 35% said they don't treat lesions, which is fascinating because every time I give a talk like this, that number seems to be going down. So I think people are understanding this disease process more and more. And about a quarter are saying, hey, let's, let's do it biologically. Uh, a third are doing you know, a core decompression plus biology. And then uh, a few percent are doing a decompression plus minus a inner graph. So it just sh shows you how these lesions are being more aggressively understood, more aggressively treated. And we will now kind of continue with my talk and I'll understand how best to treat them. I want to thank Servos for giving us this exciting opportunity to speak on their behalf. We're going to talk today about understanding subchondral bone and its impact in joint degeneration and recovery. What I, my outline for this talk is to really have you guys understand this really emerging and interesting concept. To really understand the joint is a really a, a functionally organ. We're going to go over key definitions. We're going to go historically how we've all treated these and tried to treat them, some successfully, some not. But we realized there was really a need here, a clinical need for this problem of early arthritis and degenerative arthritis. We then figure out what's the future, what's the role of BMAC, bone marrow concentration, to treat bone marrow lesions, and what are the advantages of using it both intraarticularly and intraosseous. And then now that we have a new solution and a very practical solution to fix this real clinical need. My first uh, want you to understand is that the joint is a really dynamic functioning organ. It's not cartilage and bone, it's cartilage, bone, synovium, ligament. It's a lot of things in a homeostasis, but specifically the cartilage relies on the subchondral bone. The subchondral bone is the earth to the cartilage, which is the grass on top. And they work really in conjunction. Realize cartilage is aneural and avascular and pain is from the subchondral bone. Treating the subchondral bone is probably or definitely more important than treating cartilage. And I'd say the overemphasis on sports medicine surgeon on treating isolated cartilage defects is probably unnecessary but being aggressive about treating subchondral bone is the future to affecting the health of a joint. So let's talk about key definitions. The reason why I always bring this up is there are a lot of misconceptions in literature and people scratch their head and don't really understand. When I, when I say BMAC, that's bone marrow aspirate, but that's concentrated. That's the best of the BMAC. We talk about bone marrow lesions. These are edema on fat suppressed imaging. That's bone marrow lesion, that's BML. This is a driver of arthroplasty. This is a thing that causes patients pain. There are a lot of other kind of clinical terms such as sink and sonk. Sphinx is a spontaneous insufficiently fracture of the knee. I really think of this and sonk as spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. I think of these as, as very similar entities. They're clinical entities that are usually related to, to either a subtotal meniscectomy, a root tear, or a radial tear of the meniscus that then creates an insufficiency fracture. Uh, osteonecrosis in itself can also happen, but not when it's spontaneous. I think these are all much more related to meniscal pathology. And then you have OA, which is, you know, advanced arthritis. So we know that if you follow bone marrow lesion, there's a significant correlation to the development of bone marrow lesions and ultimately cartilage wear, because the bone marrow feeds the cartilage. We also know that bone marrow lesions are driver of arthroplasty. People with mild OA and bone marrow lesions are much more likely to get a total knee replacement than people with similar OA without bone marrow lesions. Similarly, people with uh, bone marrow lesions, which we'd call from root tears, SIF or SONC, progress to our, uh, a total knee, you know, 30 to 50% much more higher than, than control patients within early time periods, three to five years. The drivers of arthroplasty are not Kellgren's and Lawrence stages, which is the stages of arthritis, 
the drivers of arthroplasty are bone marrow edema. That's a, cl a, a critical understanding of this disease process. We have to go after the thing that makes our patients change their care and get a knee replacement. So how did we used to do this? Well, when I was a resident, we used to scope arthritis. My father used to tell me, who was an, a total knee surgeon, never scope arthritis. And why do you say that? Because it doesn't work. There's multiple random RCTs. Our, our, some of our best literature in orthopedics have shown that arthroscopic lavage or debridement for arthritis doesn't help. You know, we say there's mechanical symptoms, loose bodies. We've given all these kind of uh, justifications, but in reality, when you look at RCTs, there's no difference at two years. And then even meta-analysis shows there's no difference at two years. So it's pretty clear that historically, we don't really have a good solution to arthritis. So then some, some smart colleagues thought about, you know, let's go after bone marrow lesions. And this is a, two papers, one from De Bernays and one from uh, Cohen et al. And they're showing that if you decompress a lesion, you can actually save people from total knees. However, it's, all, it's not just decompressing the lesion, it's about what you're putting into the lesions. And for the Cohen paper, they had a 30% failure rate, especially in patients with higher BMI and, and, and more mechanical malalignment, but they were putting in a calcium phosphate injection, which may inhibit bone healing as much as it helps bone healing. So this is the beginning of, they were getting on the right track, but it's not just a decompression, it's also, what are we gonna put in there? So what do we know? What do we know? Well, we know that bone marrow lesions are highly correlated with tonal knee replacement. We know that arthroscopic debridement doesn't really work. We know that older patients, heavier patients, more malaligned patients are much more likely to get a total knee replacement. And that decompression does help, but maybe decompression and calcium phosphate injection isn't the solution. So where do we go from here? We wanna fix a fracture. And there's a lot of ways to fix a fracture. A bone marrow lesion is ultimately a subchondral fracture, an insufficiency fracture. What's the best way to fix a fracture is with rigid fixation and autograft. Autograft is the key. And that goes back to basic orthopedics, basic fracture care, and it's biological therapy. Autograft is a gold standard. So how did we get to this conclusion? Well, this is from landmark work from Dr. Hernigu and who's really been a pioneer and, 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 and revolutionary in bone marrow aspirate. He had a bunch of studies to show that the importance of bone marrow aspirate. He took 140 patients, randomized them, told me on one side, BMAC delivered to the subchondral bone on the other side where there was a BML lesion, and he showed that the BMAC did almost just as good as the total knee lesions, which is kind of amazing. Now, the one thing you wanna understand about this study is they took up to 500 cc's of blood draw and they took it and they took the blood outside the body and did a lot of manipulation to the blood. To the blood. So this is a, a very much not a clinically relevant study in modern orthopedics. Uh, it's also not FDA approved in the United States because of the manipulation but it shows you the power of, of BMAC delivered to prevent and to uh, compete against arthroplasty. Another one of his landmark papers, similar technique, high blood draw, manipulation outside the body. And he had 30 patients, again, randomized this for osteonecrosis. And he showed actually the BMAC group had a lower complication rate and a much quicker recovery than a total knee group. Again, I think nobody would, would really understand otherwise. A total knee replacement, is a very effective operation and my father pretty much invented it, but at the same time, it does have its complications and there's a huge recovery process. In his last paper, again, another randomized controlled trial, he showed that when he compared uh, a BMAC to treat bone marrow lesions, he showed the subchondral bone arm was significantly more effective to postpone total knee than just BMAC in the joint. So although we'll talk about the role of BMAC in the joint versus BMAC, uh, in the bone, BMAC in the bone is superior. And that's a clinically uh, uh, important thing. And we'll talk about that more later on. Which then brings us to really the understanding of BMAC. So now that we have this incredible biological substrate, this biological impact factor, why is it so effective? And where is the best place to use it? Hernigo just kind of implied to us that uh, BMAC in the bone was superior than in the joint, but it still helps in the joint. And why? Well, it has a lot of native macrophages, which reduce joint inflammation and improves cartilage metabolism and increases synovial macrophage counts 
improves homeostasis, and it helps upregulate good cytokines and downregulate bad cytokines. It also has the best of the best of the BMAC because it has high uh, linings of CD271s and CD56. These are on the inner lining of the inner and outer table of the ileum. This is why iliac crest bone graft is the gold standard for every delayed or non-union. And it can actually have chondrogenic properties. And the technique of getting the BMAC with the servos needle is isolating those cells, those bone marrow aspirates on that inner and outer table. So it's a really uh, advantage system. So this goes back to more modern data to also to, uh, to go with Hernigu's data. And we're comparing intraosseous versus intraarticular BMAC injections. And although they both help, you can see here uh, on the VASS score here on the table to the right, intraarticular does help. And I use this routinely in all my arthritic knee scopes with a meniscus tear or if I'm doing something else. Uh, I will, uh, but clearly uh, intraosseous is superior. So there's role for both of them. But, but you wanna think of, you wanna attack the bone marrow lesion through the bone, not just through the joint. So if you wanna think of all of our clinical work in this kind of field that's really just you know, growing and burgeoning, biologics clearly can you know, have a role and in certain select patients can be an alternative to total knee and there's good follow-up up to 15 years. We wanna focus more on the bone marrow lesion. So subchondral delivery is the key versus intraarticular but they both have a role. And in reality, if you take bone marrow aspirate, you can use it both subchondral and intraarticular. We also really that you know, high volume blood draws, although some studies have such good results, are not you know, clinically practical in, you know, in modern orthopedics. So we need a practical solution to get us the best of all these worlds. So you know, what, what has Servos really done? Well, they've created a practical solution they've, where you can aspirate on five millimeters in two minutes and you can repeat as needed to maybe 10 or 15. Your average MSC counts is closer to 3,500 versus uh, up to maybe 5,500. You can treat both intraarticular as well as the bone marrow lesion in the bone. And you can go from you know, advanced disease but be, have a lower threshold to go for earlier disease. This is in contrast to the non-practical traditional Hernigu model where he has a high volume drawer, takes four hours of manipulation. They have you know, good MSC counts, but there's more complications from the volume blood draws and you have regulatory issues because of the, the manipulation outside the body. So here's some case examples where I've done where there's uh, you know, older patients all in their 50s and 60s, some of them with advanced BMI, some of them not, all with chronic bone marrow lesions, all that were injected with BMAC and all of them shown bone marrow resolution within three to six months and, and up to a year of maintaining a normal joint homeostasis. So powerful data that we have. So what, let's talk more about, you know, you know how, how is this technique? How are we really gonna be able to do this? Well, we take a bone core that takes about one or two minutes to, to get from the ileum. Uh, you, you deliver the bone core to the subchondral bone. You would then inject BMAC, uh, after placing the bone core, it shows minimal morbidity and it's, you're really emphasizing that autograft is our gold standard. So this is a multi-step solution. You have BMAC on the joint side as well as BMAC on the bone sides. You do an osseous decompression. You then deliver the bone stick and the BMAC. It's done all percutaneous. You can supplement any, uh, any bone grafting into the defect with hyaluronic acid, graft extenders, other bone grafts, or just more autograft. It's really dealer's choice. You can really use this uh, product line to deliver whatever uh, a cocktail you wanna deliver, but clearly understanding that BMAC and autograft is the gold standard. So what are our tools, right? Our tools, we have a subchondral access kit system. We have a reamer and correct system. We have the bone marrow aspiration system, which we've used now uh, for, I've used for five to, five to six years. And then we also have a bone dial and harvesting system. So it's really, you know, a, a four-step process that I'll walk you through. So first, you know, you want to understand, you know, how, you know, how to take a bone dial. This is, you know, again, a percutaneous thing off the, uh, you know, the two to three centimeters off the lateral ilium. You can use an eight gauge system or 11 gauge system, depending on how big of your bone core, you can do one, two, three matchsticks as needed. The technique is really outlined at the Servos website. 
but it's very simple to do. Uh, you know, any sports surgeon who's comfortable with uh, doing any percutaneous procedure can easily do that. If you're afraid of the ileum, you can go to the proximal tibial or distal fice, uh, femur to also get uh, graft sources. Then you do bone marrow aspirate. It's very simple to do. Obviously, spine surgeons here are doing it from the PSIS. I've done it from the iliac crest for many, many years. It's simple. You can take, uh, you know, one 5cc, two uh, or two 5ccs or one 10cc, and and it's a it's a unique kit with a unique needle that's not end bore but side boring to get all those uh, ideal cells from the inner and outer table, and you have an an aspiration needle that backs out. So you're getting a different volume or a different area of bone marrow aspirates and it's creating a, a concentrate very uh, elegantly. Once you've decompressed the lesion with a core reamer, you then have this flexible curette and you can remove or not remove as much bone that you want to. Uh, you know, this is very similar to understanding ADN surgery. Uh, if you think you have a, a bigger lesion, you want to correct more bone. If you have a smaller lesion, you may not correct any bone. You may want to just decompress the lesion. That's why what, what I think about this system, it's versatility and flexibility. Once we treat the defects, then, uh, and then we've, we, we've uh, reamed it and, then, and, and shoved it out. We then put our matchsticks, our autograph core plugs in there. And again, you can put one in, two, three, and then there's, there's a bone tamp and you tamp it in. So you get a good press fit feeling of the bone graft into that the bone defect. And like I said, you can use additional dowels, additional, additional matchsticks as you need. You can add self-use. That's a proprietary uh, bone graft substitute from Servos. You can use hyaluronic acid, or you can use any other uh, bone graft substitute that you feel comfortable with for larger defects. Again, it talks about versatility and flexibility of this system. So I just want to say, you know, we've We've really evolved our understanding of bone marrow, how bone marrow lesions affect the failure of a knee joint. We've understanding how the use of bone marrow aspirate concentrate can really help joint homeostasis intraarticularly. Now we've learned how it can really help it intraosseously. Now we have the second, third generation of a system that's highly versatile. It's very slick. It gives you autograph, which is the gold standard, and it really will make your patient's happy and it'll be a very, uh, it's a very cost effective and quick way to potentially delay or even potentially avoid the need for arthroplasty. Biologics are really the key to the future of, of healthcare. And uh, this is a great way to how we can address that. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you Servos and thank you for your time. I'm going to now like to introduce our next speaker Dr. Ignacio Dallo, he will share surgical experience and technique using Servo's tools to bring these exciting insights into the everyday clinic. Ignacio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ranawat. I am delighted to be here today. And as you said, this is an important issue and topic. I would like to open with a pool question. What would you like to learn more regarding this procedure? Okay, thank you, Dr. Dallo. I think we're ready for the poll. Okay, so we can have the results. Okay, well, uh, regardless of what you answered, I think uh, uh, this next presentation is going to be uh, uh, very good and enlightening. So uh, a lot of interest in tools and techniques and uh, success rate, patient selection, uh, questions about reimbursement uh, maybe can come at the end. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dallow, it's yours. Uh, the purpose of my lecture today is to present the tools and the technique to treating subchondral bone to advance joint preservation.
First of all, we need to understand that bone marrow is a rich source of multiple type of cells. As you can see in the slide, we have white blood cells with neutrophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils, and also we had red blood cells, platelets, different type of stem cells like hematopoietic, endothelial progenitor cells, and mesenchymal progenitor, but a small amount of mesenchymal stem cells were found in the BMAC. So now, if we revise the concept that Arnold Kaplan brings, we understand today that in vitro, these cells induce osteogenesis, chondrogenesis, or adipogenesis. But in vivo, these cells play a role in the immunomodulation and in trophic and paracrine effects, establishing a regenerative microenvironment. So these are not stromal cells. These are medicinal signaling cells. This technique, the osteocoplasty technique for subchondral bone augmentation is a minimally invasive approach for subchondral bone marrow lesion of the knee. We published this technique this year in the arthroscopy technique and it consists in three parts. The first part is the bone marrow decompression to decrease intraosseous pressure and to resect necrotic bone. As we can see, these are the new tools for servos to perform a successful bone marrow decompression. The second uh, step of this technique, a minimally invasive subchondral bone pathology, is to administrate the bone marrow aspirate concentrate or bone marrow aspirate, administrating to improve the healing potential through these mesenchymal cells, play the derived growth factors, transforming growth factors, and bone morphogenetic proteins that are inside the bone marrow. The final step is the most distinguished step because this is a transplanting living vital intact bone core segment as bone autograph, because this bone autograph induces the osteogenesis, osteoinductive effects, and also osteogenic effects. These are the surgical instrument, as you can see in the slide. Uh, is is very very simple, with an introductory needle from marrow solution, and also aspiration cannula, a blunt estillate, egg gauche, trefine needle, bone graft extractor, and measuring proof. These are the new tools from servos. This is an advanced tools to produce this technique. To maximize the yield in this technique, we aspirate bone marrow just one centimeter in each niche because we don't want to dilute the sample. With this aspiration cannula, which has a closed end and side holes, we can rotate the cannula and aspirate one cc with more cells that if we can draw 10 centimeters in, in one time. We need to be careful. First, introduce a sharp estillate and then advance with a blunt estillate. As you can see in this video, introducing the bone graft extractor into the bone marrow, we can take this small dowel of autologous bone and under microscopy examination, the cancerous bone dowels microvascular network can be seen. So now I would like to introduce our final speaker, Professor Alberto Gobi, who will share the technique and the results. Thank you very much. I would like to begin with a polling question. Which biologics do you currently use in your practice? 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Gobi. Our poll, please. We have a lot of people using PRP and bone marrow as well, some with HA, some other, and some people appear to be new to biologics, which is uh, uh, great. I think uh, everyone will gain something from uh, Dr. Gobi's insights. So over to you, Dr. Gobi. I will start with my presentation. Early clinical insight and results. Today we are talking about a newer application of bone marrow aspirate in joint preservation, the subchondral bone. Because the problem is what lies beneath a cartilage. We know that we have a cartilage degeneration, we can have a subchondral micro damage. We can also progress to cartilage destruction. So the problem is to understand what lies beneath it cartilage and how can we treat and what can we treat. Basically, we use this kind of treatment in patients that do not respond to conservative treatment after three months of uh, therapy, that they change their activities after using uh, NSAID. We want to treat uh, the so-called CIF uh, lesion that is a subchondral insufficiency fracture of the knee or the subchondral osteonecrosis of the knee and early osteoarthritis but no malalignment so if we have malalignment we should first treat malalignment what are the contraindications of this treatment if we have a poor subchondral bone quality if we have instability like fractures and the osteochondral injury that are not contained, osteonecrosis with collapse of the bone or severe osteoarthritis. The advantages of the osteocorplasty is that uh, it's a, a mini invasive technique. We only have one step. We can do an early postoperative mobilization. We don't burn any bridge with this technique and uh, BMAC can increase the subchondral bone healing potential. The limitation of this technique, there is a lack of long-term results. We are doing a study, it's a couple of years that they are using this technique and we are following up our patients. There is a lack of robust uh, osteoarthritis prevention it's uh, slightly more expensive than decompression alone. And uh, we must uh, aspirate bone marrow, but this is quite easy. Briefly, I want to show you the osteocore plastic surgical technique. We use a multi-level aspiration of bone marrow with a specific instrumentation. I prefer to use the ipsilateral iliac crest I aspirate a small amount of a bone marrow and then I change the position, unscrewing the device in order to maximize the quality of the bone marrow. Then I use this simple device in order to harvest the bone graft. I want to harvest uh, two, three, four small dowels that I will use to fill the lesion. As you can see, it's quite easy. We save these uh, small dowels of bone and we will use later. It's very important to use uh, fluoroscopy in order to assess precisely the lesion. And under fluoroscopic control, we can then insert the small dowels into the lesion. This is the device and we go directly into the lesion under fluoroscopic control. And then we deliver the small piece of bone, the dowels into the bone and we compact. At the end, we can inject bone marrow aspirate into the lesion. We wait a couple of minutes before removing the syringe in order to avoid extravasation. Actually, I like to have a sort of clotting within the cannula in order to 
stop the bleeding. This is uh, the procedure and the way that I can easily check under fluoroscopy the position of my small trocar. I can move the knee in different position. I like to check always in uh, two views, anteroposterior and lateral view. And uh, I want to make sure that I'm really in the right uh, area. And then I can inject uh, the activated beamer because I like to activate in order to have a um, fast clotting of uh, the bone marrow. And in order to activate, I use uh, platelet text that is uh, an inducer of the clotting, but you can also use autologous thrombi in order to clot uh, the bone marrow easily. I want to show you some cases briefly. This is a patient, 70 years of age male, with a chronic history of uh, knee pain, no prior trauma. And uh, the MRI show a big area of bone marrow edema that uh, actually is uh, more evident in the T2 um, sequences. This is the medial femoral condyle. You can see the lesion in anterior posterior and lateral view. After injection of uh, the uh, BMAC together with uh, small doubles of bone, this is pre-op and this is a two month. Immediately we can see that there is a reaction of the secondary bone. You can still um, observe the area where the trocar entered into the bone. And uh, we have a 12 month, this uh, uh, view that is the knee is uh, completely healed. And there is still a small evidence of where we entered into the lesion. And this is the patient with optimal clinical results going back to golf and standard activities. This is a different case because this is a female, 53 years of age, very active, doing gym, hiking, pilates, and uh, many other sport with uh, a chronic pain in the left knee, mild effusion, and uh, she was really limping, not able to do anything. And this is the MRI showing a subchondral bone uh, cyst in this area and in this area. And uh, we treated with the osteocarplasty technique, we enter exactly into the cyst and we injected bone marrow and also three small towels of bone. This is the pre-op and this is uh, the follow-up at 12 months with the completely healing of the lesion and optimal clinical results. This is the clinical score at one year of follow-up showing that we had a great improvement in Coos and in Tegner. This is uh, the CIFCA uh, lesion in a patient of 54 years of age. Actually, this was a former rugby player, still working as a trainer with uh, a North Italy team and uh, a lot of training with uh, the players, important pain, no trauma, but the MRI show an important um, insufficiency fracture of uh, the medial femoral condyle. And again, we treated uh, with uh, the same technique and we have uh, the, here the follow-up, so pre-treatment. This uh, is uh, at two months already showing a good healing. And this is a 12 month with a complete healing. And this patient went back to training with all the athletes after four months of the treatment. So in conclusion, I think that uh, this uh, technique 
is uh, a viable technique because uh, cartilage and subchondral bone, they work together and we should always consider the knee as an organ and not focus only on cartilage or subchondral bone or ligament or menisci. And uh, the results are promising. Of course, we don't have a long-term follow-up and uh, we need more data in order to have a clear consensus. Therefore, we need the prospective randomized study in order to have a, a strong, solid foundation for this kind of treatment of the secondary bone. So I thank you very much uh, for your attention. I thank you, my group. I'm open to any visit uh, from your side if you want to come to Milan and visit our center. And uh, I will now pass the program back to our moderator, Robin Young. Thank you. Dr. Gobi is just an amazing uh, speaker, and that was uh, magnificent. And and I and also just parenthetically, as I was listening to Dr. Hernagu's study being presented by Dr. Ranawat, it took me back 13 years ago when I was running the uh, stem cell summit in New York City, and Dr. Hernagu came uh, twice, and once I had him in San Diego presenting that same data. This it was one of my one of my greatest uh, pleasures working with Dr. Hernagu. At any rate, I can see we have a lot of questions. Harlan, would you be willing to do the honors and present the uh, questions to our panel? Yeah, thank you, Robin, and thank you again for allowing Servos to sponsor this webinar. Um, yes. I know we're a little pressed on time, so if there's anything I don't get to, please do feel free to reach yep. out to us. You can contact, contact us at Servos at our info at Servos.com or directly at Servos.com. Okay. Um, Dr. Ranawat, this might be a good one for you. Can you see this percutaneous bone grafting procedure also being a possible alternative to revision surgery? Um, uh, it's, it's, it's unclear what you mean by revision surgery, if they mean revision knee replacement surgery. Um, uh, I, I will say that I have used uh, decompression and bone grafting below an arthroplasty. Um, so it's another uh, uh, potential tool where you have potentially some subchondral edema below an implant. We don't have a frankly loose implant. And um, it's another tool to prevent from a major operation, taking a well-fixed implant out is a huge undertaking. And if you can verify the implant is well-fixed, you know, basically by you know, maneuvering it, and there's a little edema, you could do this either percutaneously or you could do it open. And then that's a, it's a great adjuvant. So if that's what the question was going after, yes, it's another way to expand the armamentarium of attacking bone marrow edema. And this one would be below an arthroplasty, not just to prevent an arthroplasty. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. And uh, another one for you, Dr. Renoir. Do you see the same protocol working for other joints? Are there any special considerations that jump out at you regarding using this technique in joints other than the knee? Yeah, I mean, I think um, subchondral edema is not unique to the knee. Subchondral edema is, used, is unique to a weight-bearing joint um, and even to a non-weight-bearing joint. Uh, we see it a lot in the shoulder as well. Um, so yes, I see this for the uh, foot and ankle, you know, for the talus, for the navicular, for the midfoot, uh, certainly for the hip. Um, for avascular necrosis, a whole other kind of slightly different entity than really mechanical subchondral edema. I would call tr truly uh, avascular necrosis to me is more of a dysvascular edema pattern, a different edema pattern. So yes, I think with the appropriate tools, which really, you know, we, as we touched upon, various different gauges and needle sizes, that we can address multiple uh, joints uh, and just uh, tailor the technique to the joint. Great. Dr. Shabit, you briefly mentioned that the non-surgical line will have a PRP and FAT system. Can you tell us more about those systems and when they will be available 
Also, I did see that there was a question regarding what self self use consists of. So perhaps you can add that to that answer. Okay. Um, thanks. So our PRP and FAT systems uh, have both been cleared by the FDA. Uh, you can read more about them at servos.com um, along with uh, how, how they're used and, and, uh, and other information. Uh, both of those systems will be available uh, by July, if not sooner. Um, and with regards to self-use, uh, self-use is a, a scaffold, as, as we said, we're very excited about. It's a, a hyper cross-linked um, carbohydrate polymer uh, that really provides um, a lot of the properties that we're looking for in an ideal uh, bone graft substitute um, in terms of um, its properties. Uh, it's, it's initially uh, radio transparent when you're taking an x-ray and then uh, becomes opaque as bone fills in. So you can monitor the progress of bone healing uh, using it. Um, and it really provides a, a great environment um, when hydrated with bone marrow, uh, you know, for, for the cells to really do the, uh, the amazing jobs that they can do. Great. Um, there was one quick question regarding distribution. I'm happy to take that on if we are looking for distribution partners. And if so, what is the best way for someone to contact us? Um, really simply, uh, visit the website, there's the um, option to register as a distributor that doesn't exactly give you access to our products right away, but that does give us the ability to gather some information and we'll start a dialogue from there. So that's really the best way to reach out to us from, the, from a distribution standpoint. Dr. Ranawa, for patients that get multi-year relief, do you envision repeating this procedure as part of an ongoing joint preservation strategy? Um, you know, that's, that's an interesting and uh, complicated question. I would say if a procedure works and the patients, there's not been a dramatic change in their malalignment, in their body weight, and they had a very good relief, then trying that again certainly seems uh, reasonable. I do think, you know, in all my years of treating subchondral bone marrow edema, sometimes you can treat this conservatively and the patient heals. I've never really seen it come back again. So uh, although I think there's a potential to do it again, uh, I think the biology of this process is it's a one-time hit. And usually if you kind of restore the, uh, I call it the rebar of the subchondral bone, it's kind of like how you hold a wall up, you hold it with a rebar, you in in introduce biological subchondral kind of struts, or flying buttresses, as if you think of a church, and I'm sure our colleagues in Milan can tell you much more about nice cathedrals than we can in New York, but that's how I, it's usually, I would think, more of a one-time event, but certainly has the ability to, you could do it again. And a, another procedural question, is a femoral head cord decompression due to early AVN a long shot with these tools to deliver BMA and autograph? So I've been using bone marrow aspirate to treat AVN for now about seven years. And my success of quote unquote curing AVN has never been better. And I think bone marrow aspirate is, is the key. You know, core decompression has batted 50 to 70%, depending on the, the you know, early classification and the size of the lesion and also the etiology of the lesion for a long time. Uh, there is some data coming out of um, Hopkins and, 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 some, and some doctors where you add bone marrow aspirate has certainly increased that percentage. And in my practice, it has. Um, adding actual bone graft to me is, you know, really the, the key to fixing that problem. Um, and I think this is a really uh, exciting area for more uh, research, more uh, uh, precise techniques. Um, uh, but, you know, do I think some of the uh, techniques have to be slightly revised and maybe a little more rigid, and a little bigger caliber, uh, you know, different gauges? Yes, but certainly an opportunity. Great. Dr. Shabbat, there was a question regarding the marrow solution needle and if you need to centrifuge that bone marrow. Do you want to mm -hmm. briefly take that on and overview why centrifugation is not necessary when using um, the Servos BMA technology? 
Sure. Um, so when using a traditional jam sheeting needle in order to do a bone marrow aspiration, uh, you basically do a, a single introduction of the needle and then you withdraw a large volume. And what has been shown many, many times uh, uh, in the literature is that the first milliliter or two milliliters that you aspirate contain most of the cells. And then basically what happens, you start rupturing capillaries and it's just mostly peripheral blood that comes in and floods that area that you just continue withdrawing thus diluting that really good marrow that you got at the beginning and requiring a centrifuge to try to concentrate it down again, um, which of course comes with losses because you're not gonna recover all of the cells, et cetera. So the, the marrow solutions needle, um, both the original version that we saw um, in some of the presentations and, and the updated one uh, uh, that you can get from Servos um, are designed to basically draw marrow in small amounts over an extended geography. So you're always getting that first milliliter quality marrow, uh, even as you aspirate 10 or 20 milliliters total, depending on what your procedure recalls. Because the cellularity comes out so high, there's no need to centrifuge. And then consequently, your, your recovery is 100%. Every cell you pull out, you have available to you, uh, as well as accessory cells like megakaryocytes that would be lost in centrifuging. So... Uh, it, and, and the savings of the time required, uh, no excess anticoagulant required in order to keep the, um, uh, the, the marrow from clotting while it's in the centrifuge. Uh, so it's, it's a system that, that uh, we're, we're very excited about and we've heard uh, uh, very good things from, from the physicians who've used it. Great, well, I think that is all we have for time on the Q&A portion. Uh, please do check out the Servos website and we are looking forward to hosting another one of these master classes in the near future. Um, I think okay. there's a short video. Um, yeah, and there is, Harlan. Thank you so much. Yes, and this will really be a review of basic principles. It's very short. It's uh, really well done. And with that, uh, a, a sincere thank you to everybody. And now we'll start with our uh, basic principles, a review of the basic concepts of tonight's uh, master class. Harnessing the power of bone marrow-derived stem cells through vasculogenesis to advance clinical outcomes. Bone marrow is such a precious resource that it is the most protected part of the body and resides deep inside bone cavities. Vasculogenesis is the process by which marrow stem cells move through the peripheral vasculature to the site of damage. Vasculogenesis is the engine of all tissue repair, making red marrow the engine of life. Sourcing cells from red marrow in an adult and transplanting it to the site of injury exactly mimics and supplements the body's response to injury, which degrades with age. Marrow stem cells orchestrate the transition from the inflammatory phase of the healing cascade to the proliferation and remodeling phase. Our best-in-class autologous and synthetic orthobiologic products mimic and promote vasculogenesis to treat a variety of musculoskeletal disorders and help grow bone, preserve joints, manage chronic pain, and restore your daily active lifestyle. Thank you to all of our speakers today for an excellent program. And most importantly, thanks to all of our attendees for participating in this excellent masterclass outlining the patient benefits of this amazing technology. On behalf of our sponsor, Servos Medical, and today's master faculty, be safe and stay well.